I know it was my intention um, this evening to move on to uh, verse number four, but uh, in my studies, I felt like the Lord just had a few more things to point out this evening from verse number three. So starting in Jude in the first verse, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 5, I will, put, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward, destroyed them that believed not. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are thankful and grateful, Lord, for the opportunity to gather here this evening, Lord. We heard even before the service during the prayer hour of physical pains, Lord, and uh, emotional pains, Lord, that people are going through right now. We thank you for strengthening us to allowing us to be here, Lord. I pray that as we focus in again on verse 3 and um, the third verse of Jude, Lord, I pray that you'll help us, Lord, to understand, Lord, help us to not be as Eutychus, who slept when Paul preached, Lord. Not so much physically as verse 3 is pointing out, but spiritually. Lord, challenge our hearts and spur within our hearts to man the post in which you have put us in. May we, need, may we not be as Isaiah 56 and 10, may we not be as those watchmen who your scripture says they were blind, they were sleeping, they were lying down, they were loving the slumber. May we recognize that in this house that you have put us in to serve, that we are not just bodies to fill the pews. We are not people who are called to put money in the offering plate, but we are called to be people who stand for truth. May we relate with Paul who said in Ephesians that utterance may be given unto us to open our mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Lord, I give thanks to you for all that you've done. We've entered into a new year, Lord. And Lord, as we've entered in here, I pray that you'll bless the Witten Place Baptist Church. Bless us as we endeavor to minister. Bless us and give us the words of the seek as we herald your word, Lord. May we move wisely, not quickly. Lord, we give thanks to you for all that you've done in Jesus' name. Amen. While we continue this study here in Jude, as I said beforehand, that my heart was again drawn back to verse number three to hopefully bring forth some remaining truth that rests in this verse. Jude is... Uh, in Hebrew, that name of Judah. And the meaning of the word Judah we know is that name of praise. And surely Jude, in the onset of this letter, set out to offer praise to God and his Savior, Jesus Christ, for this great salvation that we had and have. He said, I, when I gave all diligence to write unto you, of this common salvation. It was need for me, for needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. We spoke last week as this word contend, it kind of brings about in our mind this word agonize. It, it sets forth like an athlete who is set forth with intense effort to win. 
It gives us this idea of an athlete who's intensely struggling, competing, and even fighting with all of his might to win a race, to win an event. But Jude didn't leave it there. He didn't say that we should just intensely struggle. He didn't say that we should just intensely fight with all of our might. He added another word in here, and he attached this word earnestly. And when you attach this earnestly contend, it points out more than just intensely struggling. It points out more than just intensely and um, intensely seeking to win a race. But this phrase earnestly contend in the Greek, it's more than just effort expended. It is that the effort that you are expended is expending is for a noble cause. Earnestly contend means you are fighting with all your heart, mind, and soul for a noble reason. So while Jude is trying to stir up in the believers in this time, so in this letter he is trying to stir up in our hearts that in this day of apostasy, in this day of falling away, in this day where people have left the truths of God's word, Jude is trying to stir up in our hearts to get back to contending for the gospel and stand up for the gospel and reminding our hearts this is the most noble cause. Now, many years ago, maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we had one of the greatest youth outings in my childhood. We all got together. There was maybe 30, 35 of us. Brother Wilder was still here. Jeff Brown was still here. And we went paintballing. Now, this was the greatest of all times. I mean, I was so excited. And one of the last matches of the game, besides the fact that Mike Wilder broke his finger, but one of the last matches of the game, we were all posted up inside of this house, and we were under attack. The objective of the game was to capture the flag. We had it mapped out. We was all within our post. There was no way that we was going to lose this. The timer was running out, and the enemy had to get within the house to get our flag. But what happened was, as the enemies closed in on the backside of the house, Unbeknownst to me, the person who was supposed to be on post jumped out of the window and fled for his safety. Soon, this would result in me and another brother getting shot in the back. We lost the match. We surrendered the flag. But it was because the person who was supposed to guard their post fled. I don't know if you've thought of this yet, when you read verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for faith. This is interesting. Here Jude is turned to the church he said, I called to, I wrote to you, that was my original intention, to write to you and tell you, and just praise God for this salvation. But as I surveyed the situation, as I followed the leading of the Holy Spirit, it became more needful for me to write to you in the church about the apostasy within the church. Now the question is, how did the church arrive at this place of surrender? How did the church arrive at this place where the enemy was ready to capture the flag? Because people had fled the post. This is what Jude is saying to him here. They, you all have fled the post. You've fallen under attack. I was going to praise this salvation, but now it's time to say, get back to your post. Get back to contending for the faith. These people who were called to defend the church, these people who were called to defend the faith, these people who the Holy Spirit had enlightened with truth had fallen asleep at the post. They had gotten out of their armor. 
They were no longer dressed for battle. They were no longer in their position. When believers will no longer stand for truth, when believers will no longer guard the truth, the church becomes a breeding ground for false doctrine. So verses 3 and 4, Jude lays out the destructive consequences to the church. What happens in the church when we refuse to man our post? You see, oftentimes we do not like to delegate in life, but when it comes to the responsibility that God has put on each and every one of us in the church, we delegate it. When we don't delegate it by our words, we delegate it by our silence. We are called to contend. But listen here, I, I, want, I want us to understand the emotion that's given here by Jude in verse 3. Look how he says this. Now, put yourself in this position. You love this gospel that changed your life. Matter of fact, we heard it before the services, right? Well, in reference to this funeral that happened, someone who was there praised God that what? That the gospel was preached there. Well, the hope was there. That's what it means. The hope was being preached there. So you're a member of this church. And you love this gospel that saved you. And not only do you love this gospel that saved you, but you love the truth of God's word, right? So you love God's word, you love this gospel that saved you, you love this church, and you love the people in the church. And then you find out that the church that you love and the people that you love and the gospel that you love is being turned over by apostates in the church. And while the gospel's being turned over by apostates in the church, the people who know the gospel are sitting there in silence. How are you going to behave when you arrive in the church? How are you going to communicate to the people who sat in silence while the apostates were propagating a false gospel in the church? Let me show you how Jude handled this. He said, beloved, that alone in and of itself is probably how we would not start off our sentence to the people who sat by in silence, beloved. Writing to these people who were in silence while apostasy was reigning, beloved, this is with tears in his eyes. This is with a burden upon his heart. These words here in verse 3 were birthed out of the heart that loved the Lord. This letter really is empowered by emotion from Jude. You know, Paul also felt this burden. You should feel a burden for the ministry God put you in. You should feel a burden to act forth as a Christian as God has called us to. Paul said, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. It was necessity. The emphasis I want to draw ourselves to here in verse 3 is this word, beloved. Now, if any of us has spent any time refereeing children, we all know that the justification that one child who is misbehaving, the justification that they have for misbehaving is that they blame the other child for what they did to them, and that's why they are misbehaving. Which this misbehaving just amplifies a response from the parents, does it not? War breaks out the home. War had broke out in the church. And the reason that this war was happening is because of these believers who professed to love the Lord had failed to protect their post. And yet, even though they seemingly failed, yet even though they laid their armor down, even though they were not doing what they were supposed to be, he says, beloved. I wish that we would all take a lesson from Jude today. That when we see someone in the church laying their armor down, that when we see someone in the church who has, in our point of view, failed to man the post, when we see someone in the church who seems to be slipping, who may not be as faithful as they should be, 
who you think are behaving maybe in a standard that is not according to the scripture, instead of taking to the whip and criticizing, take a note from Jude, beloved. I love you. I instead of ripping someone, you say you say you love the Lord, and then why aren't you standing for truth? You say you love the Lord, then why aren't you living like I am? You say you love the Lord, then why are you not fighting against these other people who are not living accordingly? But instead of ripping, just say, beloved. Approach them in love. Now, this approach in love was not to compromise the truth. And these apostates were marring the gospel that saves. And these people who were being broke down, attacked by this false doctrine, he calls them beloved. Here's the question, I suppose, that I take away from this one word, beloved. How do you view people who are not contending for the faith like you do? When Jude looks upon these people who failed their local New Testament church, you know what he views them as? Those who were accepted in the beloved also. He don't view them as less than worthy. He makes them the same as him. But yet he also recognizes what they need is not the whip. You know, there, I just can imagine those people who maybe were surrounded by these apostates. They didn't need any more abuse. One who is saved, surrounded by falsehood and lies, is already being abused. Those who are slipping away and not faithful to the house of God, we don't need to take the whip to them and say, you wretched soul. We need to take them to the truth of God's word and encourage them again to contend for the faith. Stop listening to the world. Stop listening to Satan. Stop believing in your heart that you don't need this church, that you don't need to be around God's people, that you don't need to be around God's word. Contend again for this faith. When we see, this is another thing, when we see this doctrine of the world pulling people away from the house of God, how do you feel in your heart? What does it do to you? When you see someone not living for the faith that was once set out before them, when you see someone not living like they once did, how do you feel? It made you cry out, beloved. My brother, my sister, my beloved. It caused him to cry out to contend, contend. Jude said, we are both in the beloved. Now, I want to see two reasons here why. Why would he cry out? Why would Jew tell them that they must get back to a place where they earnestly contended for the faith? I feel that there are two emotions here. One is love for them. The other is love for the faith. Uh, now, when Jude references the faith here, Jude is referencing God's objective truth that is found in the gospel. The faith. We see ever since Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, after the ascension of Jesus Christ, that the apostles, the, the disciples, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. This is how they continued. They continued in this doctrine. This is the course that they should have continued on. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Jesus Christ Jesus. So Jude's passion, his emotion, was that we see his love for truth and his refusal to leave it. Now, on the other side of this, think about it in this manner. Jude's love for the truth, Jude's love for the Lord, calls for these believers to stand back up, get back in your post, and contend for the faith. Now, why else would Jude encourage them to get back to contend for the faith? Outside of his love for them, outside of his love for the Lord. Because there's another reality to this all. That God is a righteous judge. 
He knows how to deliver the righteous out of judgment or out of temptation. He knows how to bring judgment. I mean, even in verse 23, you could see Jude's passion of, of getting the brands from the fire and others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Jude is saying, snatch them out. Get them out of this apostate doctrine. Pull those out who are slipping away. Pull them out. Save them from the fire. His passion to getting them back on board is God's chastising hand. I do believe that if Christians would get a hold of the fact that God is a righteous judge, who knows how, who knows how to handle his children, it would bring us to a place where we hold our opinions. If we would get back to the place where we realize that God knows how to handle his own, I believe that it would bring us to a place where we're more compassionate. Matter of fact, you know, one of the worst things that can happen to a parent is to have another parent correct their children right in front of them. It almost makes the other parent hostile. I'm standing right here. Yet I believe that when we take the whip, the rod, the iron, the poker to God's beloved. He looks at us upon us and says, I've called you to encourage them to contend for the faith. Are you going to correct my child while I'm standing right here? That he's blind to their wickedness? That he's blind to the fact that they've fallen backslidden? That he's blind to their sin? It's not so. Now, we are called to encourage others. We are called to handle each other, you know, if one is offended. But in the affairs of life, God does not need our help correcting other people. So we are to sharpen each other. We are to warn each other. And we are to, in this age, to earnestly encourage others to contend for the faith. We need to get back to the reality of this. Sometimes, and we should contend for the faith, but we need to realize that sometimes we wasted good time over a bad situation that really doesn't need our help. People who manipulate God's truth, distort his word, or mix his word with error, these people who were doing this, even these believers who were involving themselves in this. We've seen this also in Galatians, that they had become bewitched. Who hath bewitched you? He went on to say in the fifth chapter, who did hinder you? How did you so soon turn from the one who saved you? He, he's talking to believers. How did you ever find yourself here? But we need to get to the place where we realize that when people fall, when people backslide, when people allow themselves, even apostates, that when we allow ourselves to be involved with false doctrine, and I'm going to point this out even a, a little more what John says about this, but when we allow ourselves to get there, it's like we're sending an invitation to heaven for God to pour out his eternal wrath on those who chose to distort his word. When Paul spoke to the Galatians, he said, I, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now notice what John says here in, 2 John, 2 John chapter 9 and verse 11, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath borne the Father and the Son. Now listen to what it says here. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not in your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. Speaking to the believer here, John says, if someone brings another gospel unto them, let them be accursed. But even further, it comes along here that we see what John is pointing out. And Judas further emphasizing that those who are involved and allowing this apostate doctrine, this apostasy in the church, they are also partaker in their evil deeds. 
not too long ago, back, well, it was actually probably 12 years ago when I worked at Castellini's, there was a Muslim guy who worked there. And his emphasis to me was that we have the same God. I'm, I read the first five books of the Old Testament too. That's my God. And at first I said, yes, it is the same God. And then I paused because it's not the same God. Because my God has a son named Jesus Christ. And the God that he has distorted does not. Yet, to accept this false doctrine, to be a sympathizer to this false truth, to, for the sake of acceptance, for the sake of camaraderie in the workplace, if I was to go along with this, I would be a partaker in his, in his evil deeds. Because his religion does not end at Jesus Christ. So even more, Jude pours his passion out to these believers to, to get to arms. To not to compromise, to contend for the faith, unless as a saved man we be a partaker of their evil deeds. He closes verse three with this: that ye should have, that ye should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Now, this word "once" here, that's in verse three, comes from the Greek word "hapax." It references a single time. It references a numerical meaning that there was a singular time that he was speaking of of which the faith was delivered. It also means that this faith was once delivered and it was sufficient and would have lasting results all throughout the end of time. Once meaning that there was no need for repetition. Once meaning that there was no need for addition. The New Testament and the Old Testament alike, 40 authors over 1,500 years, but both New Testament and Old Testament worked in conjunction with each other, always pointing and coming, always pointing towards the coming Messiah. It was once delivered. It was once proclaimed all throughout scriptures about the coming Messiah. Jude's seen, Jude seen it as it crept into the church and we see it even more now. It's not only overcome the church, it's overcome the nations. I'm going to get my English better. Don't worry here. We live in it as a nation here that was founded on the truth of God's word. Harvard, Yale, Columbia, William and Mary, Dartmouth, Princeton. What do all these colleges have in common? That they're all colleges? That they're all universities. That's not what they all have in common. That they're all Ivy League schools. That's not what they all have in common. But what they all have in common is this. They were all founded and built for the propagation of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Every one of them had a biblical foundation. Every one of them was founded for the preaching of the gospel, the training of ministers, and godly Christians to spread the gospel all across America. And where are they today? Far, far from their foundations. And we say, woe unto that. Oh, it's terrible. Look how far they've come. All those years they've been here, founded upon the beginnings of this great nation. And now what? Yet a church that's been around 30 years doesn't seem to grieve us when apostasy is reigning in the church. That's what this word apostasy means, a falling away from the faith, a turning from the faith. And that is what this little book Jude is all about. It is a warning of apostasy. It's the warning of lapsing from the faith, turning from the faith. There is nothing new to be added to this great salvation that was once delivered unto the saints. The book of Revelation testifies regarding to this matter. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. That is the command here. This is the encouragement here that we should contend 
that we should stand strong for this faith that was once delivered. But while we're encouraging others to contend, while we step up and take on this personal responsibility, as we look around and see pews that, that have people that usually sit on and they're missing, as we take this upon ourselves, as we work through the book of Jude to encourage others to contend for the faith, to get back to your post, do not forget when you encounter these people that Jude started it off with beloved. He started it off with compassion, caring, he, he was moved with the emotion that these people had fallen from their post. Lord willing, next week, we'll follow up with what these apostates had done in verse 4, what they had done to add to the gospel, how they, these men who were ordained of old uh, were ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that the Lord will continue to use this as we study through the book of Jude. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I give thanks to you, Lord, for your precious word. Lord, I pray that verse upon verse, line upon line, precept upon precept, that we're encouraged, strengthened, and we dive in with this deeper understanding. Lord, I pray that you send your spirit upon us, Lord, as we study your word. Show our eyes and hearts new things, Lord. This is the wonderful part of reading your word. Lord, I give thanks to you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.